a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is part 3 of Martin Luther's views on the Antichrist, which is actually a predecessor to me reading the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil that Martin Luther wrote in 1545, and that is considered his last work that he did, before it pleased our Lord to call him to sleep until the resurrection. This is, as I said, part three of this reading, which is just leading up to me reading this book. And I've recorded earlier today the, the, uh, the bull the Pope issued on June 15, 1520, to excommunicate Martin Luther, to condemn all his works, Actually, this is quite a copy of, uh, <laughs> you could always say, almost say, quite a copy of what Pope Pius IX did in 1864 with the syllabus of errors. Because the Pope calls all these the errors. So I'm just going to do a very, very short introduction because the actual reading of Luther's response to the bull I will put, of course, at the end of this video, so that you can now listen to my pre-recorded reading of the bull. And when that is done, I will read to you this little excerpt in this, um, in this PDF that I found. And we read that <coughs> what deals with Luther's response to the bull. And until the next uh, part starts, that is called To Worms and Wartburg. And that, of course... Uh, you will listen to then in the fourth reading of this paper. So here comes the reading of the bull Exurgit Domine, which Antichrist Pope Leo X tenth issued on june fifteenth, fifteen twenty, against Luther and his writings. Exurge Domine condemning the errors of Martin Luther. Antichrist Pope Leo X on June 15, 1520 Arise, O Lord, ask yourself, which Lord is the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible, addressing here? Never forget, the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. And when the Pope speaks of the Lord, he speaks of Tammuz, which is there, Jesus Christ, the Sun God, the reincarnated Nimrod. Arise, O Lord, and judge your own cause. Remember your reproaches to those who are filled with foolishness all through the day. Listen to our prayers, for foxes have arisen, seeking to destroy the vineyard whose winepress you alone have trod. When you were about to ascend to your father, you committed the care, rule, and administration of the vineyard, an image of the triumphant church, to Peter, as the head, or, uh, as the head and your vicar and his successors. The wild boar from the forest seeks to destroy it, and every wild beast feeds upon it. Rise, Peter, and fulfill this pastoral office divinely entrusted to you, as mentioned above. Give heed to the cause of the Holy Roman Church, mother of all churches, and teacher of the faith, whom you, by the order of God, have consecrated by your blood. Against the Roman Church you warned, lying teachers are rising, introducing ruinous sects, 
and drawing upon themselves speedy doom. Their tongues are fire, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. They have bitter zeal, contention in their hearts, and boast and lie against the truth. We beseech you also, Paul, to arise. It was you that enlightened and illuminated the church by your doctrine and by a martyrdom like St. Peter's. For now a new prophecy arises who, as the old ones wrongfully assailed the holy apostles, now assails the holy pontiffs, our predecessors. Rebuking them in violation of your teaching, instead of imploring them, he is not ashamed to assail them, to tear at them, and when he despairs of his cause, to stoop to insults. He is like the heretics, quote, whose last defense, unquote, as Jerome says, is to start spewing out a serpent's venom with their tongue when they see that their causes are about to be condemned and spring to insults when they see they are vanquished. Unquote. For although you have said that there must be heresies to test the faithful, still they must be destroyed at their very birth by your intercession and help. So they do not grow all wax strong like your wolves. Finally, let the whole church of the saints and the rest of the universal church arise. Some, putting aside her true interpretation of sacred scripture, are blinded in mind by the father of lies. Wise in their own eyes, according to the ancient practice of heretics, they interpret these same scriptures otherwise than the Holy Spirit demands, inspired only by their own sense of ambition, and for the sake of popular acclaim, as the, apostle, as the Apostle declares. In fact, they twist and adulterate the scripture. As a result, according to Jerome, quote, it is no longer the gospel of Christ, but man's, or what is worse, the devil's, unquote. <laughs> now I can't help to make a little pause here by reading this. When the Pope says in his bull that is titled Exergi Domini, condemning the errors of Martin Luther, he says, it's no longer the gospel of Christ, but a man's, or what is worse, the devil's, he speaks the truth when he speaks about his own gospel. When he speaks about the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church, then he speaks the truth. Let all this holy church, it continues, let all this holy church of God, I say, arise and with the blessed apostles intercede with mighty God to purge the errors of his sheep to banish all heresies from the lands of the faithful and be pleased to maintain the peace and unity of his only church. For we can scarcely express from distress and grief of mind what has reached our ears for some time by the report of reliable men and general rumor. Alas, we have seen even without our eyes, uh, even with our eyes and read uh, and read the many device diverse errors. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this sentence again. That was a little bit strange. For we can scarcely express from distress and grief of mind what has reached our ears for some time by the report of reliable men and general rumor. Alas, we have even seen with our eyes and read the many diverse errors. Some of these have already been condemned by councils and the constitutions of our predecessors, and expressly contain even the heresy of the Greeks and Bohemians. Other errors are either heretical, false, scandalous or offensive to pious ears, as seductive, and, uh, as seductive of simple minds, originating with false exponents of the faith who in their proud curiosity yearn for the world's glory, and contrary to the apostles' teaching, wish to be wiser than they should be. Their talkativeness, unsupported by the authority of the scriptures, as Jerome says, would not win credence 
unless they appeared to support their perverse doctrine, even with divine testimonies, however badly interpreted. From their sight, fear of God has now passed. These errors have, and let me assure you, when he speaks about errors, he speaks about Martin Luther, who bases everything that he wrote on the Bible, on the Textus Receptus, at that time probably just at the Roman Catholic Bible, because we are speaking about the fall, the time that he translates it. I don't know if he had access to the Textus Receptus at that time, that he used for the translation of the Bible. But Martin Luther speaks with the authority of the Word of God. And the Pope calls everything that he says, Martin Luther says, errors. Uh, condemning the errors of Martin Luther, we are reading in this papal bull. So, don't forget that the Roman Catholic Church, that the Antichrist of the Bible, is actually twisting the Word of God, is actually twisting the truth. That you will, if you follow him, accept that white is black and black is white. That the lie is truth and the truth is the lie. Through the way the Pope speaks, you are made to obey the devil instead of the God of creation. Never forget this when I'm reading this. These errors have, we're going to continue here, at the suggestion of the human race, <laughs> where do you find that in the Bible? <sighs> These errors have, at the suggestion of the human race, been revived and recently propagated among the more frivolous and the illustrious German nation. We grieve the more that this happened there, because we and our predecessors have always held this nation, Germany, in the bosom of our affection. For after the empire had been transferred by the Roman Church from the Greeks to these same Germans, our predecessors and we always took the Church's advocates and defenders from among them. Now, here I have to make a little comment, because... When we go into the book of Martin Luther, that is called Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, of which these recordings that I do right now are only a predecessor, when we read about that, Martin Luther will address three different points, three different faults of the popes. And the first part he deals, or the first point he deals for a very long part with in that book and with the second he deals a little bit shorter with and then still comes the third point and this third point is that Martin Luther will explain uh, to us in the book and I'm going to quote right here from the book listen he says and third whether it is true that he has transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans. Unquote. This you can find in the book of uh, Martin Luther's works, volume 41, where I will this, where I read this from, on page, um, bottom of page 289 and the top of page 290. The whole sentence reads, I wanted to cover three things. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, above councils, above emperors and angels, etc., as he boasts. Second, whether it is true that no one may sentence, judge or depose him, as he bellows. And third, whether it is true that he has transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans. Unquote. So Martin Luther addresses this point that the Pope in the Bull of Excommunication of Luther mentions here, quote, for after the empire had been transferred by the Roman church from the Greeks to the same Germans, our predecessors and we always took the church's advocates and defenders from among them. 
So the point that the Pope is addressing in this bull of excommunication will be addressed in the third part of the reading of the book of Martin Luther that is called Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. So if you want to hear the refutation of what the Pope claims in this bull of excommunication against Luther, well, hang on to the reading that's coming forth. Continuing. Indeed, it is certain that these Germans, truly German to the Catholic faith, have always been the bitterest opponents of heresies and witnessed by those commendable constitutions of the German emperors in behalf of the Church's independence, freedom and the expulsion of extermination of all heretics from Germany. Remember, we are speaking about heretics in the sense of a Roman Catholic understanding, meaning that everybody who is not bowing down to the ultramontane absolute power of the Pope and the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church is being a heretic, while as there a real heretic is the he who does not follow the gospel of Jesus Christ, does not follow the Bible, the written infallible word of God. Uh, always keep that in mind when I read this, otherwise you will not understand. Continuing in the bull. Those constitutions formally issued, and then confirmed by our predecessors, were issued under the greatest penalties even of loss of lands and dominions against anyone sheltering or not expelling them. If they were observed today, both we and they would obviously be free of this disturbance. Witness to this the condemnation and punishment of the Council of Constance and uh, of the infidelity of the Hussites and Wycliffs as well as Jerome of Prague. Witness to this is the blood of Germans shed so often in wars against the Bohemians. A final witness is the refutation, rejection and condemnation no less earned than true and holy of the above errors or many of them, by the universities of Cologne and Louvain, most devoted and religious cultivators of the Lord's fields. We could allege many other factors too, which we have decided to omit, lest we appear to be composing a history. In virtue of our pastoral office, speaking the Pope, Committed to us by the divine favor, we can under no circumstances tolerate or overlook any longer the pernicious poison of the above errors without disgrace to the Christian religion and injury to orthodox faith. Some of these errors we have decided to include in the present document. Their substance is as follows. So what's following now? are 41 points in which the Pope refutes the 95 errors, 41 of the errors that Martin Luther nailed to the church door at Wittenberg on Reformation Day, October 31st, 1517. 41 points that are counted here. Start with number one. It is a heretical opinion, but a common one, that the sacraments of the new law give pardoning grace to those who do not set up an obstacle. 2. To deny that in a child after baptism sin remains is to treat with contempt both Paul and Christ. 3. The inflammable sources of sin, even if there be no actual sin, delay a soul departing from the body from entrance into heaven. 4. The one on the point of death imperfect charity necessarily brings with it great fear, which in itself alone is enough to produce the punishment of purgatory and impedes entrance into the kingdom. 5. That there are three parts, of, uh, that there are three parts to penance. Contrition, confession and satisfaction has no foundation in sacred scripture or in the ancient sacred Christian doctors. 6. Contrition which is acquired through discussion, collection and detestation of sins, 
by which one reflects upon his years in the bitterness of his soul, by pondering over the gravity of sins, their number, their baseness, the loss of eternal beatitude, and the acquisition of eternal damnation, this contrition makes him a hypocrite, indeed more a sinner. 7. It is a most truthful proverb, and the doctrine concerning the contritions given thus far is more remarkable, quote, Not to do so in the future is the highest penance, the best penance, a new life, unquote. 8. By no means may you presume to confess venial sins, nor even all mortal sins, because it is po impossible that you know all mortal sins. Hence, in the primitive church, mo only manifest mortal sins were confessed. 9. As long as we wish to confess all sins without exception, we are doing nothing else than to wish to leave nothing to God's mercy of pardon. For pardon, sorry. 10. Sins are not forgiven to anyone, unless when the priest forgives them, he believes they are forgiven. On the contrary, the sin would remain unless, the, uh, unless he believed it was forgiven. For indeed, the remission of sin and the granting of grace does not suffice. But it is necessary also to believe that there has been forgiveness. 11. By no means can you have reassurance of being absolved because of your contrition, but because of the word of Christ, quote, whatsoever you shall lose, etc. That's Matthew 16. Hence, I say, trust confidently if you have obtained the absolution of the priest and firmly believe yourself to have been absolved, and you will truly be absolved, whatever there may be of contrition. 12. If through an impossibility he who confessed was not contrite, or the priest did not absolve seriously, but just on a jocose manner, if nevertheless he believes he that he has been absolved, he is most truly absolved. 13. In the sacrament of penance and the remission of sin, the Pope or the Bishop does no more than the lowest priest. Indeed, where there, no, where there is no priest, any Christian, even if a woman or child, may equally do as much. 14. No one ought to answer a priest that he is, a, that he is contrite, nor should the priest inquire. Great is the error of those who approach the sacrament of the Eucharist relying on this, that they have confessed that they are not conscious of any mortal sin, that they have sent their prayers on ahead and made preparations. All these eat and drink judgment to themselves. But if they believe and trust that they will attain grace, then this faith alone makes them pure and worthy. That was point 15, coming to 16. It seems to have been decided that the Church and Common Council established that the laity should communicate under both species. The Bohemians who communicate under both species are not heretics, but schismatics. Now, I'm going to explain this point a little bit. This is speaking about the Eucharist. This is taking about the Holy Communion. But in the Roman Catholic Church, the communion is split and the lay people only get the bread and the wine is withholden from them. And Martin Luther, of course, was speaking about that in the 95 Thesis that he nailed to the church door and uh, said that uh, the Bohemians who communicate under both species are not heretics but schismatics. And the Pope says, of course, no, uh, I, I've just read it to you. He condemns this point that Martin Luther made. Huh? Number 17. The treasures of the Church from uh, from which the Pope grants indulgences, are not the merits of Christ and of the saints. 18. Indulgences are pious frauds of the faithful, and remissions of good works, and they are among the number of those things which are allowed, 
and not of the number of those which are advantages. 19. Indulgences are of no avail to those who truly gain them for the remission of the penalty due to actual sin in the sight of divine justice. 20. They are seduced who believe that indulgences are salutary and useful for the fruit of the Spirit. 21. Indulgences are necessary only for public crimes and are properly conceded only to the harsh and impatient. 22. For six kinds of men indulgences are neither necessary nor useful, namely, for the dead and those about to die, the infirm, those legitimately hindered, and those who have not committed crimes, and those who have committed crimes but not public ones, and those who have devoted themselves to better things. 23. Excommunications are only external penalties, and they do not deprive man of the common spiritual prayer of the Church. <laughs> of course, the Pope is not agreeing with this point. 24. Christians must be taught to cherish excommunications rather than to fear them. <laughs> of course, the Pope does not agree with this point. <laughs> Christians must be taught to cherish excommunications, of course, is a biblical standpoint that when you are excommunicated from the synagogue of Satan, that is a blessing actually to you. <laughs> so this is what Luther says, and of course the Pope is not agreeing with him on this point. Number 25. The Roman Pontiff, the successor of Peter, is not the vicar of Christ over all the churches of the entire world, instituted by Christ himself in Blessed Peter. 26. The word of Christ to Peter, whatsoever you shall lose on earth, etc., is extended merely to those things bound by Peter himself. 27. It is certain that it is not in the power of the Church or the Pope to decide upon the articles of faith, and much less concerning the laws for morals and uh, or for good works. 28. If the Pope with a great part of the Church taught so and so, he would not err. Still, it is not a sin or heresy to think the contrary especially in a matter not necessary for salvation, until one alternative is condemned and another approved by a general council. 29. A way has been made for us for weakening the authority of councils, and for freely contradicting their actions, and judging their decrees, and boldly confessing whatever seems true, whether it has been approved or disapproved by any council whatsoever. 30. Some articles of John Huss, condemned in the Council of Constance, are most Christian, wholly true, and evangelical. These the universal Church could not condemn. 31. In every good work the just man sins. 32. A good work done very well is a venial sin. 33. That heretics be burned is against the will of the Spirit. Number 34. To go to war against the Turks is to resist God who punishes our iniquities through them. 35. No one is certain that he is not always sinning mortally because of the most hidden vice of pride. 36. Free will after sin is a matter of title only, and as long as one does what is in him, one sins mortally. 37. Purgatory cannot be proved from sacred scripture which is in the canon. I'd like to know how the Pope is going to refute that <laughs> point from Martin Luther, because I don't see purgatory in the Bible, but still... On, per, on point 37, the Pope condemns this error, quote-unquote error, of Martin Luther. 38. The souls in purgatory are not sure of their salvation, at least not all. Nor is it proved by any arguments or by the scriptures. 
that they are beyond the state of meriting or of increasing in charity. 39. The souls in purgatory sin without intermission, as long as they seek rest and abhor punishment. Number 40. The souls freed from purgatory by the suffrages of the living are less happy than if they had made satisfactions by themselves. And finally, point 41. Ecclesiastical prelates and secular princes would not act badly if they destroyed all of the money bags of beggary. That were the 41 points the Pope holds against Martin Luther, that Martin Luther held against or held against the Church in his 95 Theses. Now the bull continues. No one of sound mind is ignorant how destructive, pernicious, scandalous and seductive to pious and simple minds these various errors are, how opposed they are to all charity and reverence for the Holy Roman Church, who is the mother of all the faithful and teacher of the faith, how destructive they are of the vigor of ecclesiastical discipline, namely obedience. This virtue is the front and origin of all virtues, and without it anyone is readily convicted of being unfaithful. Therefore we, in this above enumeration, important as it is, wish to proceed with great care as is proper, and to cut off the advance of this plague and cancerous disease, so it will not spread any further in the Lord's field as harmful thorn bushes. We have therefore held a careful inquiry, scrutiny, discussion, strict examination and mature deliberation with each of the brothers, the eminent car uh, cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, as well as the priors and ministers general of the religious orders, besides many other professors and masters skilled in sacred theology and in civil and canon law. We have found that these errors, or these, are not Catholic. We have found that these errors or theses, sorry, we have found that these errors or theses are not Catholic, as mentioned above, and are not to be taught as such, but rather are against the doctrine and tradition of the Roman Catholic Church and against the true interpretation of the sacred scriptures received from the Church. Now Augustine maintained that her authority had to be accepted so completely that he stated he would not have believed the Gospel unless the uh, authority of the Catholic Church had vouched for it. For, according to these errors, or any one or several of them, it clearly follows that the Church, which is guided by the Holy Spirit, is in error and has always erred. This is against what Christ at His ascension promised to His disciples, as is read in the Gospel of Matthew, quote, I will be with you to the consummation of the world, unquote. It is against the determinations of the Holy Fathers, or the express ordinances and canons of the councils and supreme pontiffs. Failure to comply with these canons, according to the testimony of Cyprian, will be the fuel and cause of all heresy and schism. With the advice and consent of these our venerable brothers, with mature deliberation on each and every one of the above theses, and by the authority of Almighty God, the blessed Apostles Peter and Paul, and our own authority, <laughs> Here he says it. And our own authority, <laughs> we condemn, reprobate, and reject completely each of these theses, theses or errors as either heretical, scandalous, false, offensive to pious ears, or seductive of simple minds, and against Catholic truth. By listing them, we decree and declare that all the faithful of both sexes must regard them as condemned, reprobated, and rejected. 
we restrain all in the virtue of holy obedience and under the penalty of an automatic major excommunication. Moreover, because the preceding errors and many others are contained in the books or writings of Martin Luther, we likewise condemn, reprobate and reject completely the books and all the writings and sermons of said Martin, whether in Latin or in any other language, containing the said errors or any one of them, and we wish them to be regarded as utterly condemned, reprobated and rejected. We forbid each and every one of the faithful of either sex in virtue of holy obedience and under the above penalties to be incurred automatically to read, assert, preach, praise, print, publish or defend them. They will incur these penalties if they presume to uphold them in any way, personally or through another or through another or others, directly or indirectly, tacitly or explicitly, publicly or occultly, either in their own homes or in other public or private places. Indeed, immediately after the publication of this letter, these works, wherever they may be, shall be sought out carefully by ordinaries and others, ecclesiastics and regulars, and under each and every one of the above penalties shall be burned publicly and solemnly in the presence of the clerics and people. As far as Martin himself is concerned, O oh good God, what have we overlooked or not done? What fatherly charity have we omitted that we might call him back from such errors? For after we had cited him, wishing to deal more kindly with him, and urged him through various conferences with our legate and through our personal letters to abandon these errors. We have, been, we have even offered him safe conduct and the money necessary for the journey urging him to come without fear or any misgivings which perfect charity should cast out, and to talk not secretly but openly and face, to, and face to face after the example of our Savior and Apostle Paul. If he had done this, we are certain he would have changed, his heart, uh, changed in heart, and we would have recognized his errors. He would not have found all these errors in the Roman Curia which he attacks so viciously, ascribing to it more than he should because of the empty rumors of wicked men. We would have shown him clearer that the light of day that the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors whom he injuriously attacks beyond all decency, never erred in their canons or constitutions which he tries to assail. For, according to the prophet, neither is healing oil nor the doctor lacking in Galat. But he always refused to listen, and, despising the previous citation, and each and every one of the above overtures, disdained to come. To the present day he has been contumacious. With a hardened spirit he has continued under censure of a year. What is worse, adding evil to evil, and on learning of the citation he broke forth in a rash appeal to a, to a future council. This council is going to be, by the way, the Council of Trent, 25 years from the moment the Pope writes this year. This, to be sure, was contrary to the constitution of Pius II and Julius II, our predecessors, what, uh, that all appealing in this way to be punished with the penalties of heretics. In vain does he implore the help of a council, since he openly admits that he does not believe in a council. <laughs> uh, in what council that Martin Luther believes, we will read when we read the book uh, that he wrote against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. Because the council that Martin Luther wants is not the council that the Pope wants. We will get into that when we read the book. 
Now therefore we can, without any further citation or delay, proceed against him to his condemnation and damnation as one whose faith is notoriously suspect and in fact a true heretic with the full severity of each and all of the above penalties and censures. Yet, with the advice of our brothers, imitating the mercy of Almighty God, who does not wish the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and live, and forgetting all the injuries inflicted on us and the Apostolic See, we have decided to use all the compassion we are capable of. It is our hope, so far as in us lies, that he, Martin, will experience a change of heart by taking the road of mildness we have proposed, return and turn away from his errors. We will receive him kindly as the prodigal son returning to the embrace of the church, or the mother, I add. Therefore, let Martin himself and all those adhering to him and those who shelter and support him, through the merciful heart of our God and the sprinkling of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which and through whom the redemption of the human race and the upbuilding of Holy Mother Church was accomplished, now that, uh, know that from our heart we exhort and beseech that he, that he cease to disturb the peace, that he cease to disturb the unity and truth of the Church for which the Saviour prayed so earnestly to the Father. Let him abstain from his pernicious errors, that he may come back to us. If they really will obey and certify to us by legal documents that they have obeyed, they will find us in the affection of a Father's love the opening of the, front, uh, of the front of the effects of paternal charity and opening of the front of mercy and clemency. We enjoin, however, on Martin that in the meantime he cease from all preaching of the office of preacher. And now follows a little um, something that is written between, uh, between brackets. And um, this is an added text that was obtained from a secondary source uh, that you can read of in the translator's book from Hans J. Hillebrand, The Reformation in Its Own Words. So these are, uh, these, this is a little added text to the bull, but still it is in the bull because the translator found it in another source of the bull. And here it continues then. And even though the love of righteousness and virtue did not take him away from sin, and the hope of forgiveness did not lead him to penance, perhaps the terror of the pain of punishment may move him. Thus we beseech and remind this Martin Luther, his supporters and accomplices, <laughs> accomplices like in crime, you know, of his holy orders and the described punishment. We ask him earnestly that he and his supporters, adherents and accomplices desist with six, within sixty days, which we wish to have divided into three times twenty days, counting from the publication of this bull, which is the 15th of June 1520, at the places, and men uh, uh, as the, at the places mentioned below, from preaching, both expounding their views and denouncing others from publishing books and pamphlets concerning some or all of their errors. Furthermore, all writings which contain some or all of his errors are to be burned. Furthermore, this Martin is to recant perpetually such errors and views. He is to inform us of such recantation through an open document, sealed by two prelates, which we should re uh, receive within another sixty days. Or he should personally, with safe conduct, inform us of his recantation by coming to Rome. We would prefer this letter way in order that no doubt remain of his sincere obedience. If, however, this Martin, his supporters, adherents and accomplices, 
much to our regret, should stubbornly not comply with the mentioned stipulations within the mentioned period, we shall, following the teaching of the Holy Apostle Paul, who teaches us to avoid a heretic after having admonished him for a first and a second time, condemn this Martin, his supporters, adherents and accomplices as barren vines, which are not in Christ, preaching an offensive doctrine contrary to the Christian faith and offend the divine majesty to the damage and shame of the entire Christian church and diminish the keys of the church as stubborn and public heretics. This was the complete contents of, uh, content of the Pope of excommunication called Exorge Domine condemning the errors of Martin Luther, written by Antichrist Pope Leo X on June 15, 1520. Martin Luther took this bull, took the writings of canon law and decretals and other bulls of the Pope that were in the library in the university that, were, that he worked in and burned all of it publicly. Burned all of it. That's what he thought of the bull of excommunication of the Pope. An excommunication of the Pope actually is a blessing to a real Christian. And with this I will end this reading for today. And of course we will continue in this paper Martin Luther's view on the Antichrist next time. And... Um, then we will see <laughs> how many more readings I need to be before I actually come to the book that Martin Luther wrote in 1545, his last book that he ever wrote against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. But I think it was quite important to get through the complete bull of excommunication for once so that everybody knows what the Pope actually thought of in this example, 41 of the 95 theses that Martin Luther nailed at the church door at Wittenberg in 1517. So, then now returning to the PDF, reading about Luther's response to the bull, the actual article that I skipped because of reading of the bull of excommunication. The threatening bull, Exurge Domine, primarily the works of Eck, Cajetan and Prierias denounced 44 of Luther's published statements as poisonous, offensive, misleading for godly and simple minds, uncherishable, un uncharitable, counter to all reverence of the, for the Holy Roman Church, the mother of the faithful and the mistress of the faith. Condemning anyone holding or defending these positions it warned Luther that he must return to the bosom of the church within sixty days. Meanwhile, it ordered that he keep silent and his books be burned. After its arrival on December 10th, Luther burned it as well as books of canon law. Leo X signed the actual bull of excommunication on January 3rd, 1521, but for various reasons it was not delivered until much later. The Pope expected his condemnation of Luther to automatically trigger his temporal punishment, probably by execution. Before his death, Emperor Maximilian I had promised Leo that he would enforce any papal verdict against Luther. On January 18, 1521, Leo ordered Maximilian's successor, Charles V, to do likewise. Now papal nuncio Girolamo Alexandro then tired to convince first Charles, and then the Diet of Worms, to simply condemn Luther without granting him a hearing. Meanwhile, replying to Exurge Domine's charges in his defense and explanation of all the articles, Luther said, quote, Beware of the Antichrist, the Pope, unquote. Arguing that Christ was the rock of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Luther said that interpreting this text to suggest papal authority was a lying device, 
perverting God's word. This, Luther continued, confirmed Paul's prediction that Antichrist's entrance would be, quote, by the power of the evil spirit who enters only by means of lies and false interpretations of scripture. Unquote. In this book, he also called the Pope Antichrist for giving people false assurance through indulgences, for denying that belief was required for forgiveness of sins, for spreading errors throughout the world in exchange for the wealth of the nations, and for imposing on people a system of contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Returning, the communion, returning to the communion issue, Luther said Jesus gave both bread and wine to everyone and told everyone to repeat the ordinance in his remembrance. But, quote, the Pope teaches us differently and gives us only a half sacrament, unquote. You know, during the reading of the bull, I went a little bit into that and told you that in the Roman Catholic Church, people only receive half of the communion, which is only the bread and not the wine. Yeah? And that has uh, reasons that the Roman Catholic Church thinks that it is a sacrilege if anything, if anything of the wine is spilled. And to forcome that, people are forbidden to share in that. And the Hussites in Bohemia were giving full communion, and they, were, and they were called, because of that, heretics by the Pope, as you can remember from me reading in the bull. But Jesus said anyway to repeat the ordinance in his remembrance. So first of all, we learn here that the communion, as we know it, as it is written in the Bible, the Last Supper, it is an ordinance. It is not a sacrament. What's the difference? <laughs> well, the word sacrament is Roman Catholic. There are no sacraments in the Bible. God doesn't ordain any sacraments, but he gives ordinances. As I said before in another video, we don't have any rights. God doesn't give us rights. God gives us rules, laws, ordinances, and ways to obey him and worship him. But not any rights. And Jesus said, concerning the Last Supper, to repeat this ordinance in his remembrance. Now, of course, we are leading up to the Council of Trent at the end of, uh, of the book of Martin Luther that I will read in the future. And in the Council of Trent, it is, among other points, of course, stated that anybody who takes the communion, as stated in the Bible, and does not accept the Roman dogma of transubstantiation, but repeats this ordinance in remembrance of Jesus Christ, he is anathema. He is cursed. That's what the Roman Catholic Church thinks about that. That's why Luther says here, and the Pope teaches us differently and gives us only half a sacrament, but he gives us half a sacrament where this is not a sacrament, it is an ordinance. It is something that we do in remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It doesn't make us sacred. It's no sacrament. Anyway, reading on. Then, addressing Leo, meaning Antichrist Pope Leo X, Luther offered to recant if the Pope could prove that he wasn't banned and condemned before God by Paul's curse on anyone who changes his Lord's ordinance and, uh, and resists and perverts his gospel. Unless he could prove this, Luther said, the Pope should not take offense when Luther called him the Antichrist. Furthermore, Christ merely invites us to partake, whereas the Pope compels us to go to the sacrament once a year. Thus, in both 
his commands and his prohibitions. He is the direct opposite of Christ, as befits a true Antichrist. This reflected a general papal tendency to bind Christians with man-made laws, while this unspeakable Antichrist at Rome treated God's word as though it were a carnival joke. A little interesting is this little sentence. This reflected a general papal tendency to bind Christians with man-made laws. Isn't there a place in the Bible in the New Testament where Jesus Christ is actually accusing the Pharisees and Sadducees of exactly the same thing by taking away the possibility for people to enter into the kingdom of God because of their vain traditions? Because, as he says, you teach the vain traditions of man instead of the gospel? And the Pope does the same thing. He orders every man to be bound by man-made laws instead of the scripture, instead of the holy word of God. Now, the last little paragraph states, one of the statements Leo had condemned in Exergi Domini was, quote, the burning of heretics is contrary to the will of the Holy Spirit, unquote. Luther responded that papists had burned the good Christians, John Huss and Jerome of Prague, and the Pope and other heresy hunters have burned other good Christians, including the godly man of Florence, Girolamo Savonarola, thus fulfilling the prophecy concerning the Antichrist that he will cast Christians into the oven. In this booklet, Luther also condemned the error about the free will as a peculiar teaching of Antichrist and denounced the creation of mendicant orders as, quote, one of Antichrist's tricks, unquote, for increasing his own power. So, this has quite been a long reading with 56 minutes and probably not only interesting but also very <laughs> breathtaking and you have to concentrate to get it all and I want to leave you with this at almost an hour long and next time we're going to read on uh, Luther's view on the Antichrist and his development on how this view was formed and why and what's the basis of that and how he got more and more convinced in his life that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetical Antichrist when we read the next part of this paper called To Worms and Wartburg in 1521. Until then, thank you very much for watching and listening and commenting, and until next time, God bless you, and bye-bye.